tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 16 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. To prove it all night, you shook me all night long, and I ended up with night fever. The night begins to shine, and I wear sunglasses at night, and I ain't even done with the night. So bring on the night, as tonight's the night as I get into the rhythm of the night. At the end of the night, I realize I could do this all night long. Just being silly with titles of songs with the word night in them. And of course, I'm doing that because I am the master of the segue. <coughs> Two tales to night with the word night in the title, which embark on the darkest side of the night and possibly leave you crying in the night. They are brought to you fine listeners from the talented minds of Hank Belbin and Ashley Fontaine. Let's get after it. John has just been fired from his banking job in New Orleans. For revenge against his boss, he drives to Lafayette and plans to murder him. But along the way, he gets lost in the Atchafalaya swamps. Eventually stopping off in a rundown motel, John soon encounters some strange and evil entities. Presented as a found tape recording, Last Night in Town is a short, sharp tale about guilt and punishment set against the backdrop of the fabled Louisiana swamps. And now, for your indulgence, Last Night in Town by Hank Belbin. The world is more alive at night. It's like God isn't looking. Elvis Presley. The following tape recording was found at the scene at the Sundance Motel near the Bell River, Louisiana. Testing. One, two. Well, I'm alive and here I am. Yet another lonely night. Driving on yet another dark highway in this foul year of our Lord 1988. The headlights of other solitary drivers are all passing me by in a haze out there. It's all just a blur. I wonder how many of them are thinking the same thing, cooped up in their little aluminum coffins like me. Life. It's all just some goddamn pantomime, and we all know it. But we go through the motions regardless. You walk down the streets at night and everyone's behaving like dogs. The buildings are all scarred with jailhouse tattoos and the diesel smell in the air makes you want to gag on your own tongue. 
kind of makes you wonder what it's all for, don't it? Driving alone in the emptiness of night always has that ability to install a sense of melancholia in me. Here I am, and here lies behind me just another wasted day gone up in smoke. The awful city in my wake spills out like an overflowing sewer across the delta. Here lies a man, not that the cavalcade of prostitutes and losers on the street corners would care anyway. Usually, I will be all somber and depressed on this kind of night, but not anymore. Not now. No, tonight is a special night. It's my last night in town. I'm grinning from ear to fucking ear. I just left New Orleans. I just robbed the CVS there on the outskirts. Stuck my blade right in the man's face and told him to give me everything. No, I didn't kill him. I just put the fear of God in him instead. Under my arm as I left the store was a crate of Miller Lite, two bottles of hooch, one of which is now half empty, and two packs of Marlboro Reds. Not to mention $259. Yep, it's gonna be one wild night. I stole one of them dictaphones that you see on detective shows too. Little handheld tape recorder thing. That's what I'm speaking into right now. Treat this recording as a confession, a diary, an acknowledgement of my existence, or whatever you choose. It doesn't really matter to me. By dawn, I won't be here anyway. And I'll tell you why. That asshole boss of mine called me into his office just before clocking out on a Friday. And you know what? He fired me right there. Can you believe that? 30 years I've been with that company. 30 years of my life given to them and some slick little bastard in a tie calls me in and fires me without severance on a Friday afternoon. He said I was underperforming. That's the word he used. I hate that kind of talk. That's one of them buzzwords that carries a lot of weight but doesn't actually mean anything. 20 years my younger and he fires me. No talk, no warnings, just a cold cut. The little bastard probably can't even tie his shoelace and he's got more money than the entire floor I worked on. I went to Brown. I worked in finance my entire life and he treated me like I never meant nothing. But I tell you what does mean something. I stole his car, a suave little Mercedes with a convertible roof. That'll teach him. Why? Because I just don't give a crap anymore. I've been nothing but a good person my whole life. And where has it gotten me? Just another divorced 50-year-old bum whose kids won't even pick up the phone to him anymore. Well, tonight, cowboy, it ends. I'm going off the edge. Out with a bang. I'm heading to Lafayette and I'm going to kill that slick little prick. On the passenger seat is my Remington 870 shotgun and two Colt 1911s. He deserves it. That's what I think. People like him get to do what they want and the rest of us suffer in silence. The world is on a diagonal now, but tonight I'm the balancing point. On the I-10. It's a bit later now. Must be midnight. Can't quite read my watch on account of the bourbon. My, I thought best to document this night as and when it unfurls before me. And boy, I thought I'd document this. I've just pulled away from some fly-ridden gas station outside Baton Rouge. I think it was off Interstate 10. I just filled up the little tin can that was my boss's car. And as I did, I stood there in the silence. The night was quiet. Quieter than normal. I had to admit I felt pretty exposed. The air seemed thicker than usual. It was hot. The pops of sweat ran down my back like beads of oil. The flies buzzed all around the twitching halogen lamps in the forecourt. I peered beyond that island of light at the station and out to the dark bayous of Atchafalaya beyond. They stretched on endlessly into the sultry night. Toads riveted. And at the edges of the swamps just past the highway, the hissing of those crocs was as clear as cop sirens to me. 
Something was not right back at that station. Maybe I've had too much to drink, but something don't feel right at all. There's a net settling over us tonight. I saw a man slumped over back there. He was near the ATM. He was convulsing and fitting. Cashier in the station didn't take any notice of either of us out there on the forecourt. I stood at the car and looked down at him. At first, I just thought he was just some junkie, uh, just another crumpled life. But then I saw his mouth and what was frothing out of it, a thick, bubbling white liquid. Rabies. The poor son of a bitch had rabies. When you get to the point where you're fitting on the asphalt of some gas station, you're pretty much fucked. His face was all swollen and bruised like he had been stung by a gang of hornets, like his face was half filled up with water. But the thing that really scared me was how in between the man's excruciating fits, he managed to glare right at me and point his finger at my body. His eyes were wide and black and hollow and he just stared up at me, gasping, while all the froth and sickness of the damned seeped down his vest. He didn't even seem to be living anymore. His mind had left him. Maybe he was asking for help? It was like a warning or a bad omen, but one I didn't understand. I was so shook up that I leapt into the car and sped away from the station, kicking up bits of stone as I did. The gas station disappeared into the wall blackness behind me like a fading star. I dared not look back in the rearview mirror, just in case. That man was still there on the forecourt, pointing at me, dying, choking, decaying, his swollen, bloodied eyes still staring at me. That was a while ago. I managed to finish the first bottle of hooch. Now I have no idea where I'm driving to. Guess I just want to get away from the crazy bastard. Because of that, I think I've taken a wrong turn somewhere. That's what happens when you... See some lone dying man sucking on his last petrol-soaked breaths at the edges of society. It sends you off the reservation, too. Something's not right. Feels like tonight is our night of judgment. There's a pestilence coming. All around me are those endless bayous and swamps. The single road I'm on, carving its way down the middle of the dark mire like a great tarmac snake towards my terminus. Anyway, let's forget all that for now. i tell you one thing, though. Louisiana is hotter than the devil's asshole. Must be old Scratch himself coming for me. Time for a cigarette and a swig of bourbon. I think it's time for the Rolling Stones, too. Let's welcome the old bastard to my side. Shall we? Two hours go by. Here's the visual. I'm lost. I don't know where in Christ's name I am. I even entertained the idea of turning back and sleeping this one off, but now I am well and truly in the back old beyond. Cajun country. So much for one wild night. This was not the type of wild I had in mind. The rows and rows of cypress trees out there in the bayous are starting to make me feel uncomfortable. And I'm still speaking into this dumb tape recorder like it means something. It's one in the morning and I've started on the Millers about halfway through the crate. I think I may be heading towards Vermilion Bay, but can't be too sure. You know, they call it the Bay of Blood. Vermilion was a red substance made from mercury sulfide. Imagine that. Ah, who even cares? The swollen silver moon is hanging high in the sky above. It's casting this weird scintillating glow over everything. Out there on our swamps as well, the Creole fishermen made their huts. Makes me scared. How the hell do people live out here? Might as well live on the far side of Saturn. The road just keeps... Wait, what the fuck is that? There's people on a road ahead. Four of them. Shit. I've just passed them by. Jesus Christ, I think they were dragging a body off the road. 
I just saw a couple of shirtless, ragged people dragging something across the asphalt and into the woods back there. Whatever it was, it wasn't moving. It looked like a body. Sheesh. There's something wet on the road. It's black. I can see my rearview mirror. What the hell? Did I just witness a murder? Their faces didn't look right, man. The waning of the moon highlighted all their disgusting features. They looked like... That guy back at the gas station. Their faces were all swollen and bleeding from the eyes. Have they got the rabies too? What the hell's wrong with these people out here? I swear one of them had some kind of scythe. I don't like this, man. I'll turn him back. Much later. It's two in the morning. I guess I was pretty shook up after what I saw back there on them dark roads, so I stopped off at the nearest motel I could find. The Sundance Motel, it's called. Somewhere down by Morgan City. One of them yellow stained old lodges that only truckers and drug dealers dare stop off at. I'm sitting on a single bed in the cheapest room they had. I can't put that scene out of my head. For some reason, I can't be shut of it. I mean, what the hell are those people doing out on that road at night with that body? They move different. Like all walked like they were drunk and didn't know where they were. Something's abroad here. Feels like it's all connected somehow. The rabid man back at the gas station is trying to warn me, but... Warn me of what? I don't know. The motel is a sad old thing. Faded neon sign with half the letters blown out. The mold on the walls of the room is slick and black and full of promises of illness. The carpet is damp and I'd be damned if I take my shoes off. I set out to murder my boss tonight, but instead, I ended up in the armpit of hell. Nothing else to do but drink myself into oblivion. Nothing else to do but wonder just how far off the rails I've fallen. By sunup, the last of the booze will be gone. Whoever finds this tape, if I'm no longer alive, I didn't commit suicide. The mold on the walls probably got me. Yes, that was a joke, asshole. Very funny. Ha ha ha. If it's any consolation, I was never going to kill my boss. I guess I just wanted to hurt him like he had hurt me. I wanted him to fear for his life. And for my sins, I'm fearing for mine. Maybe they'd go easy on me if I returned the car with a full tank of gas. Much later into the night. I don't know what to make of any of this. Oh, it's God, I don't. I just woken up in the days on the damn floor of this shitty motel room. I'd finished all the booze, and I guess at some point in the night, I must have passed out on the carpet here. When I finally got up out of the puddle of vomit I found myself in some time later, I looked up at the clock on the wall. It said 3.13. It still says 3.13, but that's impossible. I must have checked into this dive at two in the morning. That plus a couple of hours drinking and watching bad cable TV should have taken me up to at least daybreak. I remember the blur of adverts and softcore porn. But it's still nighttime out there. The clock on the wall still says 313. The second hand ticks but doesn't edge any further forward. Something is wrong here. But that's not what has got me so riled up though. Something else just happened. Something I'm not sure I had the words to even explain right now. Is I raised up and sat on the bed about ten minutes ago, trying to shake my head clean of the hangover, I'd heard something. This low scratching and slapping sound. It was coming from my left, towards the bathroom. It sounded like lazy flesh rubbing against wood. Blearily, my eyes were tugged towards the bathroom door. On the other side of the cheap pine door, something was rapping against it. I dropped my gaze to the base of the door and saw that the lights were on in there. The two pillars of shadows that could have only been legs moved around in the light. Someone was in there. Someone was in the room with me. 
I jolted up in shock. I didn't remember ever using the bathroom. I didn't even know what it looked like. The second I'd gotten into this roach pit, I started drinking, and that was that. But when I'd woken up from the blackout, the fear sunk back into me, cold and hard. My heart pounded in my ribcage like a nuclear bomb. It was the same fear I'd felt when I saw them strangers on the road earlier, the ones that were collecting the roadkill. It was the same primal fear that a deer must feel when the hungry stare of a wolf is on its back. Instinctually, I had reached for the shotgun by the pillow. I didn't make a sound. Each movement was slow and cautious. With one smooth motion, I grabbed the shotgun and cocked it. The mechanism only gave off a faint click. I stood up from the bed. Then, with slow, soft steps, I approached the bathroom. The shotgun pointed out ahead of my torso like a protecting spear. I sucked in quiet, controlled breaths and crept towards the door. On the other side, I heard coughing, shouting, sobbing. Whatever it was, it was once a human. I reached out and clasped the doorknob firmly in my palm. Then, with resolution in me, I yanked it open. When the door swung back and revealed what was on the other side, I screamed. There, standing in the middle of the bathroom, bathed in the twitching amber lights, was a man. Except he wasn't a man anymore. Parts of his body were all infected and swollen like they were filled with pus. The thing craned its head up and stared at me. He saw me and came staggering out of the bathroom towards me, trousers down around his ankles. His shirt was all ripped up like he'd been brawling with a crocodile. Worst of all, his face was swollen and bloated, just like all the others. The pores in his skin squirmed like they were filled with worms. Jesus, who are you? I think I asked him, but he didn't say anything. He couldn't. Thick black liquid poured from his mouth and eyes. His hollow eyes reflected a mind that had left long ago. Now there was only this rabid and feral animal in front of me. He coughed a bunch of spit and blood onto the carpet. Then he screeched and hissed as he lurched at me, arms outstretched, ready to embrace me as one of his own. I yelped and without even thinking raised up the shotgun and let loose with two 12-gauge buckshots. The shotgun kicked like a mule in my grip and the deceased man absorbed the shots like they were nothing. I stood in front of the writhing thing and was utterly shocked. He was still standing. The two shots hit him dead in the chest and put a hole straight through his rib gauge. Any normal human would have hit the deck like a sack of spuds, but he didn't. I remember screaming. Maybe I shouted something at him too. The man spasmed and then tried to run at me. In a split second, I let off one more shot at his head. The thunder of the shotgun sounded like a stick of dynamite going off in my ears. The man's head snapped back from the impact. Then, when his head raised back up again, it was all mangled and bloody. I just stared at what was left of his face, clutching my shotgun tight. As he stood there, his body swaying from side to side, the skin on his head peeled off like a banana. It dropped down to his neck in flaps and the writhing black husk underneath was like nothing I'd ever seen before. I don't think I've described that properly. Let me say it like this. Underneath his skin, there were no bones. There was no skull. Instead, this thick slithering worm came out from his throat and took the spot where the man's face used to be. I gasped and took a step back, pointing my Remington up at it. He looked like a black anaconda that had been hiding in his chest the whole time. The man's body slumped to the floor with a thud. I stood above him and peered down at the utter horror before my eyes. All around his corpse now was a strange black blood that seemed to be teeming with some kind of pond life. The slick black worm protruding from his neck then wriggled free of the body and slithered off quickly to the bathroom. It was more scared of me than I was it. It fled down the plug hole of the bath and left behind it a trail of clear ooze, like a slug. What the fuck, I think I had said. Then I threw up some. I tell you, I was so overwrought that I dropped my shotgun and fell to my knees before God right there and then. I prayed and prayed. What was happening scared the shit out of me. Is this punishment for my sins? Is this my perdition? I don't know. All of that was about ten minutes ago. 
and the clock on the wall is still saying 313. I think this might be hell. Just to make sure I wasn't dreaming, I got up from the bed and peered out the yellow stained windows of my room. In the dim parking lot of the motel were about ten of those same people. They're waiting for me. All of them bloated and motionless, like they don't know what to do with themselves. Some are stumbling around and crowing up at the moon. Others are standing still and throwing up this tar-like substance at their feet. Their skin is bubbling with sores and boils. I don't know what's going on here, but they're all sick. There's a pestilence going around. Maybe something in the water. It all started with that man back at the gas station. I should have listened to him. God damn it. Four hours later. It's been at least an hour now. I haven't moved. Neither have they. I'm sitting at the desk and the clock still hasn't moved forward anymore. I think this might be my end. Jesus, how did I get here? You know, I had a wife once. Been divorced about ten years now. Clara was her name. Yeah, everything after that went to shit. I guess since the papers were signed, it all went into a downward spiral. Can't say I'm surprised. I haven't been exactly truthful, by the way. Now that it seems I'm about to join the ranks of hell, I guess I should be. He didn't fire me for underperforming. He fired me because I drank too much. God damn. Since Clara left me, I've been hitting the bob pretty hard. I tried to come off it, but the withdrawal's like nothing I'd ever expected. It's... So, here I am. Just another lonely bum on his way out. I doubt I'm the only one. It hurts in your chest, you know? That razor-tipped sadness that only cuts in deeper as the years crawl by. Eventually, everything good leaves you. Until you're nothing but a bloated vessel, full of cheap booze and blue ruin. In the end, you find yourself spilling your guts out over the sides like some burst mains pipe full of rag water, spewing it all out to anyone who will listen. You find yourself sitting alone in a roach pit, mumbling into a stolen tape recorder, doubting yourself, and trying to piece together the broken mirror of just how you managed to fuck your life up so much. Did I imagine the whole goddamn thing? I don't know. Part of the alcohol withdrawal is hallucinations. God, I pray it's that. As I look across from me, back at the unnamed headless and diseased man that once was a human, he's still on the carpet not ten feet away from me. So, I guess this must be real. I don't want to be like this. If I get out of here, I'm gonna change. I promise. Just give me one shot. Just let me live. I'm gonna make a break for it now. There are ten of them infected outside my window, but the car is only across the parking lot. My guns are loaded, and I want to escape. If I run, I think I can make it. Well, I did say it was going to be my last night in town. Here goes nothing. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, Last Night in Town, by Hank Belbin. Hank Belbin is a horror author and screenwriter from Southampton, England. Primarily focusing on cosmic horror, Hank has had several short stories published on online magazines and is working on publishing his second novel set in Dartmoor, England. He has published two full-length plays that have been successful runs at Edinburgh Fringe Festival and also published a literary fiction novel called Moonland. The story is about a struggling actor living in London who falls in with drugs and kidnapping. For more details, go to www.hankbelbin.com. That's H-A-N-K-B-E-L-B-I-N.com. Regina Parker is the chief of police of the small southern town of Rockport, Arkansas. She's struggling mentally and physically from the recent loss of her husband and her daughter's drug addiction and subsequent stint in rehab. Heartbroken and overcome with grief and loneliness, 
She's ecstatic when her twin brother Reed shows up at her door with a surprise. He retired and is moving back to Arkansas to help his sister. The joy of having her brother by her side to help ease the pain from her troubles only lasts one night because the very next day, society collapses. Regina only thought things were bad before, yet she's about to find out just how much she'll miss the last night before the world ended. And now, for your indulgence, The Last Night Before the World Ended by Ashley Fontaine. The Last Night Before the World Ended Even so close to midnight, the unseasonable heat and humidity clings to the night air with a ferocious grip. Though only one week until Christmas, the temperature feels like mid-September. Regina Parker groans. Enduring one summer per year in Arkansas is enough. The second she turns off the motor, familiar wetness pools underneath her arms and vest. Only three other vehicles are in the parking lot of the police department. The black Dodge Charger is hers, and the tan Ford minivan belongs to the city of Rockport's only radio dispatcher, Eugenia Jeannie Renfro. An old Chevy truck held together by rust and a southern favorite, duct tape, sits directly in front of the station. Regina chuckles to herself, wondering how much longer the old hunk of metal had before leaving its owner, Officer Roger Singleton, stranded on the side of the road. Once inside the station, she hears Jeannie and Roger whining about the warm temperature in the front office. I swear I'm just gonna turn into a big old pile of damn clothes. A nice cool winter is supposed to be our reward for tolerating hotter than Hades summers. My grandma surely agrees with you on that count, Miss Jeannie. I'd lay money down she's eaten two whole boxes of popsicles in the last three days. Regina walks up to the duo and joins a conversation. Weather report on the radio earlier said temps should return to normal by Wednesday. They said there's a 30% chance of snow on Christmas Eve. Jeannie crinkles her nose and laughs. A damp lock of overprocessed blonde hair flops onto her chubby cheek. This is Arkansas. Weather can change in the blink of an eye. Evening, Chief Parker. Roger tips the worn out Stetson toward Regina. Evening, boss lady. How was it tonight? Regina reaches past the youngest of Rockport's two other law enforcement officers and hands her ticket book to Jeannie. At only 24, Roger Singleton is young enough to be Regina's son. Fairly quiet until round eight. That's when Kirk Sorrells decided to test out his latest batch of moonshine. I'm never going to get the image of his flabby naked ass running down Highway 270. Corralling him into my unit might require extensive therapy to forget. I'm giving serious consideration to adding a plastic cover over the back seat. Is he in the hall? Roger grins and motions toward the single holding cell at the back of the building. Yep, sleeping it off. I didn't feel like taking him all the way to county. Figured the less time he spent naked in my backseat, the better. I cited him for public indecency. When he wakes up, he can go home. You didn't give him a public intox charge? Roger asks. Giving the old fart another expensive charge isn't going to make him stop drinking. Only rehab will. I plan on talking to Judge Harmon about that tomorrow morning. The man's already living hand to mouth. Taking more money from Kirk's pocket will just drive him to work harder on his side business and drink even more. That ain't like you, Chief. Your change of heart wouldn't have anything to do with Jesse's troubles, would it? Regina bristles at the mention of her daughter. Most of the time, Regina enjoys living and working in the small town with a population of less than a thousand, except for moments like now. The many perks of the quaint town keep her from moving to a bigger city along with strong family ties to the rural area. She is the fifth generation born and raised in the tiny burg and the first female and second family member to hold the title of chief of police. Unfortunately, the flip side of living in a small town is everyone's business is everyone's business. The gossip train travels at breakneck speed. Within an hour after taking a strung out Jesse to Brightwater's treatment center in North Little Rock, all of Rockport knew. Dozens of concerned citizens called to offer their condolences and support. Several of the ladies from First Baptist brought over enough casseroles and salads to last Regina two full weeks. 
They even held hands and prayed for God to take away Jesse's cravings for meth. Shaking off the horrible memory, she answers Roger's question. Maybe. I've learned quite a bit about how addiction works lately in counseling. One of the top spots on the list is financial stressors. Addicts don't handle life's little ups and downs very well. Money trouble is sometimes a trigger. Old Kurt needs rehab, not jail time or additional bills to pay. He's been out of work for going on three years ever since the sawmill closed. Roger cocked his head, a look of shock across his face. Huh, I'll be. Never thought I'd hear those words leave your mouth. If anyone asks me about your change of heart, I'll tell them it's from this god-awful heat. Wouldn't want our citizens to think their hard-nosed chief of police is getting all sentimental in her old age. Gee, thanks. Have a good shift. Stay safe. Regina waves to both before walking outside and over to the charger. Slipping behind the wheel, she grins as the 5.7-liter engine rumbles to life. A lump of sadness sticks in the pit of her stomach because the house will be empty. God, how she misses Jesse. She refuses to cry. Enough tears were shed the day she left Jesse in rehab. Her daughter had bounced between rage-fueled screams of hatred to tear-filled pleas for her mother not to leave her. The look of terror and fear on Jesse's face when Regina walked out the doors made her chest clench with sorrow. By the time she made it to the car, the racking sobs were so intense she couldn't do a thing except lean against the doorframe and squall like a lost kitten. Not gonna do it. No crying today. Regina cranks up the radio. Catch scratch fever blares throughout the interior. At the top of her voice, she belts out the words alongside Ted Nugent, grateful for the distraction. Five minutes later, she pulls up into the driveway of the small three-bedroom house she shares with Jesse. Turning off the car, she stared at the place. Christmas is gonna suck this year, she mutters while biting her lip to keep from crying. I miss you, Fred, so much. Maybe you could have kept Jesse from using drugs. I sure failed. Damn it. This wasn't how we had planned things. I need you here. Doing all this alone is going to break me right in two. Her cell phone buzzes. Exiting the car, she smiles. Ever since they were born, the bond between her and Reed was sometimes eerie. Your timing is perfect as usual. I was on the verge of a major pity party. <laughs> One of the many perks of being a twin is sensing disturbances in our mutual force. Reed's laughter is deep and throaty. So, you home now? How was your shift? Unlocking the front door, Regina flicks on the lights and holds in a deep sigh. Hearing Reed makes her miss his presence. He had moved to Laredo, Texas over 25 years ago after joining U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. When Fred was still alive, they made the yearly trek to Laredo for Christmas. The tradition ended when Fred died. I'm sure not quite as exciting as yours. Aren't you supposed to be keeping our borders safe from drugs and bad guys? Only on days I'm at work. Regina stops in mid-stride as goosebumps sprout across her arms and neck. You aren't in Laredo, are you? Don't tell me you drove over 700 miles. Racing to the front room, she pushes the curtains back, stunned to see headlights blink twice, then shut off. Tossing her phone onto the couch, she opens the door and steps outside as Reed climbs out from behind the wheel of his SUV. In seconds, his hulking six-feet, four-inch frame lumbers up the driveway to the porch. He flings his beefy arms around Regina's shoulders. You should have told me you were coming, you know, giving me a chance to cook or... Reed smiles while holding up a sack of food with a big red bow on top. The smells wafting from inside gives away the fact it is Italian. Which is exactly why I didn't give you fair warning. You can't cook for squat. Here, take this inside so I can get my bags. Ass? Wait, bags? And what's the deal with the freaking bow? Your way of saying Italian takeout is what you got me for Christmas? Yes, bags. They come in quite handy when someone moves. You know, to store all your belongings in. Ain't no way I'd let the movers handle my treasured collection of hats and boots. Regina looks down at the bag and notices a note. Reaching inside the door, she flicks on the porch light and peers at the paper. Written in her brother's atrocious scrawl, it read, An Italian feast to celebrate my retirement. 
You? Retired? Boots? Hats? Are you moving back for good? Yep, I need to be here to help my niece. Oh, and her mother. She's sort of a scatterbrain at times. Then again, the bowl of lemons she's been handed hasn't helped much. The way I figured, she needed someone rough and tough to lean on. Remember all the years you've given me grief about not marrying or having kids and I always said I had my reasons? Well, taking care of you and yours would be one of the answers. Reed grins and walks past her, turning his body sideways while passing through the threshold. Dumbstruck, Regina stares at his rigid back. She cannot believe he's home. Rather than bursting into tears from the amazing turn of events, she resorts to humor in an emotional situation. Glad you're here, bro. However, if you start snoring, you're sleeping on the porch. Reed laughs. Fair enough. Same goes for you. Now, enough chatting. Time to eat. I've been on the road a long time and I'm starved. Shaking her head at the crazy turn of events, Regina heads to the kitchen to fix their plates. Grateful, her twin is by her side. The Day the World Broke Regina, you decent? Regina answers her brother's question. Just lacing up my boots, come on in. Reed opens the bedroom door and scoots inside, shutting it behind him. His face is pale, jaw clenched tight. Regina's gaze falls to his waist, noticing he's wearing a loaded gun on his hip. What's wrong? You haven't watched or listened to any news today, have you? Uh, no, I've been up a total of ten minutes, which included my shower. Reed joins Regina on the bed, setting her cell phone between them. The station called you numerous times, so I figured something was up and answered while you were in the shower. Jeannie said there's a big pile up on I-30 involving an 18-wheeler and several vehicles, multiple casualties. Damn, I hate those big rigs. God, I hope no kids are... Hush, Regina. Listen, the accident isn't why I came in here. Sensing something's wrong, she goes into cop mode. Then why did you? News reports are flooding in from all over the world. There's something going on. Not just here, but everywhere. And no one can give a plausible answer to what's behind it. Behind what? Power outages, fires, explosions, riots, and people walking around who shouldn't be. Regina scowls. If that little joke was your way to help me deal with all the carnage from a semi-accident, I don't find it funny. Shut up and listen. You need to see what I mean. Words simply won't suffice. Crossing the room, Reed turns on the small TV to CNN. A jerky image from a cell phone video appears. A passenger inside a car with an arm stuck out the window is filming an accident on the freeway. Mangled, twisted metal is strewn out across several lanes, glass and debris spread even further. Tendrils of smoke rise from the demolished vehicles. A man crouches over and shovels the innards of a dead female EMT into his mouth. Another EMT comes into view and tries to distract the man. When he looks up, his face is covered in blood and gore. A large piece of metal protrudes through his neck. An even bigger one pierces the chest cavity. The video zooms in and Regina sees his eyes are solid black. And his neck is broken. Regina gasps and covers her mouth with both hands. The other EMT has a stun gun. When he gets close enough to strike, the man with the mortal injuries jumps over the corpse he had just been munching on like it was a hurdler in the Olympics. Latching his broken, bloody fingers around the EMT's arm holding the weapon, his head juts forward as he sinks his teeth onto the man's neck. Blood spurts out, coating them both and the ground in seconds. Regina's gaze falls to the ticker at the bottom of the screen. It reads, Phoenix Motorist captures video of injured man attacking rescuers on Interstate 10. Arizona Governor deploys National Guard. All travel, including air and vehicle, has been halted in Arizona. Stay tuned for similar videos from New York, Seattle, Los Angeles, Afghanistan, and China. President Thompson to address the nation at... Oh my God! It's happening across the entire globe? How? Why? No. Fucking. Way. 
Shaking, Regina grabs her belt and jacket, motioning for Reed to turn the TV off. Brother, please go get my daughter. I've got a town to protect. I know. Reed nods. Go. I promise to get her. You just take care of the citizens. And yourself. Thank you. They lock gazes, and each senses the absolute fear of the other. Adrenaline in overdrive, Regina bolts from the house. Once inside the cruiser, she secures the wireless headset, refusing to use the radio, fully aware citizens are probably monitoring communications. Using voice commands, she calls the station while backing out of the driveway. It's about damn time, Chief. Things are crazy here, Jeannie yells. I understand there's an accident on I-30. Which mile marker? 98, right at the start of the construction. State boys are already there. Roger and Clint are helping with traffic control. Regina flicks on the lights without the siren. I'll let them handle it. On my way. Should be there in less than two minutes. Jeannie clears her throat. Good, because you just received an email marked urgent from the governor. Regina blows through a stoplight. What does it say? I can't open it. Oh, another just arrived. Says a code will be sent. Regina's phone beeps with an incoming text. The message contains a long stream of numbers. To my phone. Yeah, just got it. What's going on, Chief? You know I don't put too much stock in what I see or hear on the news because most of it is crap. But what I saw earlier, it was like watching a horror movie. Regina pulls into the parking lot. Exiting the car, she runs inside. Jeannie's face is pale and her eyes the size of saucers. Calm down, Jeannie. Let me see what the governor sent, and then we'll sort through all this mess. If something bad is happening, we need to stay strong. Residents will be panicked enough. They'll need someone with a cool head to keep things together, okay? Jeannie stands so Regina can sit. Okay. Go get some coffee or water, stretch your legs, and take a breather. Without a word, Jeannie heads to the kitchen. Regina waits until she hears the rattle of cups before opening the email. She enters the password from the text and waits. In seconds, another box opens. She leans closer to read the screen. The National Guard has been deployed. As of 6.05 a.m., I implemented the Arkansas Emergency Operations Plan. As you know, the AREOP is designed to reduce vulnerability and loss of life and damage to property during any form of disaster or crisis. We are working in conjunction with federal authorities. Our goal is to rapidly respond and assess the current nationwide catastrophe. The situation is a large-scale event, requiring all levels of government take proactive measurements to respond. As such, I have directed all members of the Highway Patrol to secure all roads coming into and out of our state. No residents will be allowed to leave this state until all citizens are accounted for and tested. Representatives from the state health department will arrive in each county seat in less than an hour. All local and county law enforcement agencies are to instruct every citizen of their respective jurisdiction to report to the local high school, which will serve as the joint field office until containment is reached. Once a citizen is tested and deemed clear, they may return home, but must remain in their local area until all 75 counties have completed the testing. Residents who test positive must be immediately quarantined. The National Guard will take charge of each county jail. Citizens who test positive will be moved to the jail. Biohazard suits are to be worn during the entire operation. Regina rereads the entire statement twice. The words on the screen send waves of fear pulsating through her body. Dear God, what the hell is going on? She hears Jeannie coming down the hall, so she hits the print button and then closes the email, deleting it as instructed. Fingers shaking as she picks up the pages off the printer, she shoves them into her jacket pocket and stands. So what did... Oh shit, you look like a ghost just passed through you. Are we under attack from another demented group from overseas? Did someone hit us with a dirty bomb or bio attack? Forcing her voice to remain calm, Regina motions for Jeannie to sit. I need you to listen to me. You are going to be very busy in the next few minutes. Swamped, actually. A-R-E-O-P has been enacted. Get Roger and Clint on the radio. Tell them to return to this station immediately. I need their help getting everyone over to the high school. 
EBS will activate in five minutes, instructing everyone to go there. People are going to flip and start calling to ask why. Do not try and answer their questions. Just repeat the edict to go to the school. Got it? Jeannie's bottom lip trembles. What if they want to talk to you? Ask you what's going on. Regina heads down the hallway to the closet housing extra firearms. Just reiterate, they need to go to the high school. They'll be safe there. If someone pressures you for more, hang up. Before Jeannie can respond, the phone rings. Though a seasoned 20-year dispatcher, Jeannie hesitates before reaching out to grab the receiver. 911, what's your emergency? Unlocking the closet, Regina yanks a shotgun from the rack and loads it with shells. Inside the small space, she whispers, God help us, this isn't happening. Her cell phone vibrates. Looking down to see who is calling, a cold shiver races up her spine as she answers. I don't need to ask you why you're calling. You got the same email. Sheriff Roger Calhoun clears his throat. The sound of radio chatter in the background makes the hairs stand up on Regina's neck. Yep, some nerdy looking fools dressed like they're ready to walk on the moon just arrived, along with armed military escorts. They just waltzed in here and took over my jail. Bastards had the nerve to tell me and my deputies to leave. Jim Grayson demanded to know what was going on. Get this, one of the soldiers handcuffed him and went to lock him up. Forcing herself not to sound frightened at the tone in the sheriff's voice, Regina asks, When to lock him up? What, did the soldier change his mind? No, the guy in the drunk tank did. Sheriff, just spit out what you're trying to say. Time's wasted. Fine. You know Ricky Baber, right? Doesn't every law official in this county? Biggest crackhead around, and I'm pretty sure he's the one who got my daughter hooked on meth. Why? Picked him up last night after he rolled his truck. He didn't seem to have any injuries, but guess we were wrong. What happened? My deputy and his military escort found him face down in the cell. When they went in to check on him, he jumped up off the floor and attacked Jim and the soldier. Ricky tore Jim's lips and nose off before the grunt shot him in the head. It was utter chaos. Holy shit. Sheriff Calhoun lowers his voice. We tried to take Jim to the hospital, but the guys in white took him away. Wouldn't tell us where they were taking him or why. When I tried to intervene, one of those bastards stuck a rifle in my face. A sense of dread crawls through Regina's mind. Let's finish this discussion once we get everybody to the school, okay? Ears might be listening. Agreed. See you at the school. Oh, and Parker. Yes, Stay safe. You too, Sheriff. Regina disconnects the call, mind spinning from the news. Part of her feels a twinge of satisfaction, a sense of justice, knowing Ricky Baber is dead. The other part wonders if he was like the disgusting thing she had seen on the news earlier. Dead, yet moving. Still in the dark as to what is really going on, the terror of the situation almost consumes her. Forcing it deep down inside, she pulls herself together because now is not the time to freak out. Her family, friends, neighbors, and even strangers in Rockport need her to remain calm. After loading three weapons, she hears Roger's terrified voice crackle from the mic on her shoulder. Need backup? Shots fired. Officers down. Repeat, officers down. Bullets aren't stopping him. Oh my God. Without thinking or saying a word to Jeannie, Regina grabs a shotgun and runs out the front door. Letting her training and instincts take over, using the fear pulsing inside as fuel to her muscles, Regina turns on the lights and siren on the cruiser and barrels out of the parking lot, damn near sideswiping a Humvee. Glancing in the rearview mirror to see if any of the vehicles change direction and follow, she let out a sigh of relief. They ignore her and continue toward the high school. After the request for backup from Roger, the radio is silent which is even more unnerving than Roger's terrified pleas for help. An eerie sense of foreboding settles over her mind. Lines of vehicles leading into downtown Malvern clog the southbound lane of Highway 270. The entire county is home to less than 34,000 people, yet judging by the heavy congestion, it seems half of them are on the road. Some of the motorists she recognizes as residents of Rockport. In less than two minutes, Regina crosses the bridge over I-30, and glances over her left shoulder. 
The accident shut down both lanes of the freeway. The flashing blue strobes of numerous units dot the area, interspersed with red lights from a fire truck and ambulance. She looks right and notices a county unit blocking the interstate about 100 yards away, holding back a throng of vehicles stretching out for miles toward Benton. Reaching the entrance ramp, Regina turns onto the freeway and pulls up behind a state trooper's unit. Scanning the area, a cold shiver races up her spine. A jackknifed big rig is close to 100 yards up ahead, the contents of the trailer strewn across both the east and westbound lanes. A crumpled SUV nearly split in two is less than 10 feet from the rig. Deflated airbags coated in red hang limp on the driver and passenger sides. What had once been a sedan of some sort is on its side in the median about 20 feet away. Glass, metal, and liquid cover the entire area around the site of impact. Up ahead about 50 yards sit both Roger and Clint's units, each empty. Where the hell is everyone? Leaving the car running, she steps out into the cold morning air, shotgun in hand. Pausing to listen, she hears nothing but the rumble of engines in the distance. The eerie silence is unsettling. Accident scenes, especially ones involving numerous vehicles, are usually a flurry of noise and activity. Gas, burned rubber, and the unmistakable odor of eviscerated bowels mix with the coppery scent of blood, making Regina's nose twitch. Though used to the stench from working hundreds of accidents over the course of her career, each time around the foulness, her stomach twists into a knot. She contemplates using the radio to reach Roger or Clint, yet some primal instinct in the back of her mind urges her to remain quiet. Raising the shotgun, she walks over to the unit in front of her, aim steady and sure. The white charger with blue stripes is about 10 feet away, the driver's door wide open. No one is inside, so she continues toward the ambulance about 15 yards ahead. After passing the front of the cruiser, Regina stops short when she hears a strange noise. It takes several seconds to recognize the sound. No way. Shifting her approach so she is hidden by the open doors, Regina holds her breath. Edging closer to the back of the ambulance, she keeps her steps quiet, sidestepping debris on the pavement. The gurgling, crunching noises grows louder. Regina feels her stomach revolt, threatening to release its contents all over Interstate 30. The world around her stops when she peeks around the open door into the interior of the ambulance. Two mangled bodies, presumably victims from the wreck, are loaded onto gurneys in the back. The one on the left looks like a young female, maybe 20 or so. The right side of her head is crushed in, glass and debris embedded in her neck. Mounds of blood mat a once beautiful head full of dark hair. No more blood oozes from the mortal injuries, indicating her heart no longer beats. The other one is male. Both are strapped in, ready for transport to the hospital, IVs already in place. The man's face is a mutilated mess. His lower abdomen sports a gaping wound and Regina sees part of his internal organs are exposed. A large chunk of flesh is missing from his left forearm. For some reason, Regina flashes back to the video of the accident on I-10 in Phoenix. Looks like bite. Bile burns up her throat as she realizes the man's jaw continues to open and close as he bites at the air, his shattered teeth clicking together. On the floor between them is an EMT, or what once had been one. The body cavity is ripped open, and a middle-aged woman dressed in jeans and a Texas Longhorn t-shirt hovers over the corpse. Regina blinks twice in shock as she watches the thing tear out a handful of intestines and shove them into her mouth. Body and mind frozen in horror, she feels the access of her world. Everything she knows and has experienced until this very moment shift. A human being is eating another human. A dead human being is trying to bite the air. Don't say it. Don't even fucking think it. No wonder the military is taking over and insisted everyone be tested. This can't be happening. I've got to be at home dreaming. God, please let me be experiencing a nightmare to end all nightmares. In those few seconds while staring at things that simply cannot be, all she can think about is Jesse and Reed. The two most important people in her life are in danger, along with, it seems, everyone else in the world. Her survival instincts take over, shoving all the disturbing sights and sounds aside to be dealt with later. If this is a dream, 
It's time for me to kick some fucking ass. Hey, gut muncher, want some fresher meat? The bloody monstrosity that once was a living, breathing female jerks its head at the sound. Regina notices the eyes are solid black and her skin is a strange mottled gray color. She doesn't hesitate. There is no humanity left in the expression. The dead eyes are primal. Crimson-covered lips, oozing blood from its meal, curl into a snarl. The thing hisses while lunging. Eat this! The recoil from the shotgun blast causes her entire body to shudder and ears ring. The body flies backwards, smashing into the gurneys and then crumples into a pile on the floor of the ambulance. The spray pattern from the shotgun at such close range removes 90% of her head, leaving only a few strips of flesh sticking up around the neck bone. Pausing only long enough to ensure the destroyed mass of flesh is dead, again, Regina pumps another round into the chamber and heads toward her men's vehicles. I always knew you was a smart gal, Chief. Take the head off. It's the only way. Just like in the comics and movies. Who knew? Regina spins around at the sound of a familiar voice. Shit! I damn near blew your head off, Clint! Officer Clint Chesterson stumbles forward before collapsing onto the cold pavement. Regina runs to his side. The back of his dark blue jacket is shredded apart, and she sees sections of his exposed skin are full of deep, ugly claw marks. Large chunks of flesh are missing where his kidneys are located. Blood soaks his shirt and pants. Too much blood. Bending down next to him, she notices a pool of red mixed with saliva forming by his mouth. It spreads out across the ground already the size of an orange. She scans the area for any more undead visitors. Seeing none, she leans the shotgun against the ambulance and hoists Clint off the ground. Just hang on, son. I'll get you to the hospital as soon as I find Roger. Clint spits out a mouthful of blood at the same time he tries to say something. Regina shushes him. I'm gonna put you in the back seat for a minute until I secure this area. Any idea where he and the others might be? Last I saw him, he's out in High Tower and Reynolds. They were on the back side of the semi. The driver was trapped inside and they were all working on trying to get him out. I was helping the EMTs load up the gurneys when I heard Roger yell for help. Took off running in their direction. But by the time I made it, well, shit went down fast. Regina's mouth is dry. She forces her lips to move. Then what? It was a waste of time. The guys were surrounded. Surrounded? By those things? How many? You saying you think Roger's dead? Clink groans as Regina leans him against the hood of her unit. Pausing long enough to grab the mic on her shoulder, she radios for backup. No response other than the continual static. She tries again requesting an ambulance. Nothing. Where the hell is Jeannie? After unlocking the back door, she eases Clint into the seat. He moans once and answers, Yeah, I think so. There were four of those things surrounding them all. They attacked at the same time. They were so fast. I took aim but didn't fire. Afraid I'd shoot Roger. Right when... One knocked him to the ground. I heard something behind me, but turned around too late. It jumped me from behind. Oh, God, did you kill it? Clint leans his head against the seat and winces. Yeah, but not before he, it, whatever the hell you call it, tore me up. Unloaded my Glock until it quit tearing me apart. Found out taking its head off was the trick. <laughs> Just like on TV. Who knew those crazy people in Hollywood were right on the money? Regina watches tears run down the boy's face. Clint's skin is pale and clammy. A fleeting memory of the day she interviewed him flashes by. He had been just a few months shy of turning 22, all muscle and attitude, ready to get on the streets and make a difference in the community he had grown up in. A former football star at Melvern High School, Clint Chesterson had been a textbook jock. He had skated through classes, his teachers looking the other way when he turned in homework obviously not a product of his own. Clint's sole focus was getting a football scholarship to Fayetteville to play for the Razorbacks. 
The lifelong dream of the only son of Harold and Jeannie Chesterson ended the final game of his senior year after Clint suffered a torn ACL and broken left foot. The image of him sitting across from her while begging for a chance to have a real career makes Regina's heart pound with grief. She had wanted to say no, tell him he wasn't ready, yet in the end, she caved. Something behind his big brown eyes struck a sensitive spot inside her heart. Against her better judgment, she decided to give the kid a chance. Now, as she stares at his life-altering injuries, Regina regrets the decision. A gash about six inches long starts at his temple and ends under his chin. She sees milky white sections of his skull and cheekbone. A steady stream of red leaks from it, dripping onto the collar of his jacket. She takes off her own and presses it against the wound and then guides his hands to take over. His breathing is short and shallow as his lungs fill with fluid. From the sounds I heard from the others, they didn't make it either. Listen. Clint reaches out a bloody hand and grabs Regina's. She winces at how cold it is. I've got maybe half hour tops. Don't worry about me none. I've already made peace with my maker. After what I saw earlier, I ain't sure I want to stick around for what's coming next. Go. See if you can help the others. Take me to the hospital be a wasted trip because I'm a goner. Just be careful, Chief. Those things are fast and hungry. Don't talk like that, son. I'll get you. Clint's grip intensifies as he interrupts. No, you won't. Just promise me to get my parents out of here. Please, Chief, don't let one of those monsters get to my mom and dad. Promise? Regina doesn't have time to answer Clint's request. Movement to her right catches her attention. Shutting the door, she spins around and pulls her Glock. Her hands shake while she plants her feet and takes aim at the grotesque monster that had once been Officer Roger Singleton. Son of a bitch, this ain't happening. Tears run down her cheeks as she pulls the trigger, wondering how she'll tell Mary Louise Singleton she had to shoot her already dead grandson in the head. Before Roger's corpse hits the ground, the tornado siren rings. Looking up into the cloudless sky, she wonders if she's losing her mind. Choking back the sobs as she watches her friend bleed out onto the roadway from the bullet she put into him, she forces herself not to succumb to the urge to collapse into a ball and cry. The emergency wail cuts short and is replaced by a robotic voice. All residents of Hot Spring County are to report to Malvern High School. You have ten minutes to comply before house-to-house -house searches begin. The message ends and the siren trills again sending its loud waves across the expanse of Hot Spring County. Regina refuses to look at Roger's corpse and steps away from her car toward the fire truck up ahead. She cannot live with herself if she doesn't check on the others before leaving. Her altruistic intentions vanish at the sight of several people. No, things crossing the interstate. They are all heading toward the source of the noise blaring above them. Regina's heart skips a beat. Genie. The closest siren is less than 100 feet from the station. She tries the radio on her shoulder. The results are the same. Nothing. Regina focuses her gaze on the bloody, strange moving bodies. The rising sun glints off the badges of two of them, and that is confirmation enough. Spinning around, she jumps into her car. Glancing at the rearview mirror, she sees Clint's eyes are closed, hands still holding her jacket against his head. Hang on, Clint. I'll get you to the hospital in a flash. Just hang on. Clint responds with a slight nod. Jerking the wheel left, she makes a half turn and crosses the grass-covered median. Once on the other side and on the exit ramp, she floors it. Back on 270, Regina slows down while navigating around the throng of stalled vehicles. Some people stand outside or lean against their hoods, talking nervously to their fellow neighbors. Regina's stomach roils. They are in immediate danger, and they do not have a clue, and she's only one person. How in the hell can she help an entire community? Worried they may not be interested in any more instructions from the government, she opts for a different tactic. Turning on the outside speakers, Regina barks into the microphone. This is Chief Parker of Rockport PD. Get back inside your vehicles, roll up the windows, and lock your doors right now. 
Danger is coming from I-30 East. If you are armed, shoot the head. Repeat, shoot the head. The reaction is immediate. Residents jump back into their vehicles. A few hesitate while looking toward the freeway. Regina makes it to the center lane and guns it. The hospital is less than three miles up ahead in the middle part of old downtown Melvern. The streets are barricaded and a large contingent of armed military personnel are in the way. They stand guard at the red light at the intersection of Cross and Highway 270, blocking the path to the hospital. Cars inch forward as IDs are checked before allowing residents to proceed to the high school. Shit, Regina whispers. Fearing Clint may have heard the fear in her voice, she quickly adds, Almost there, Clint. The sick, mewling grumble she heard while at the accident site on the freeway hits Regina's ears. Before she can react, Clint's fingers poke through the partition and grabs a handful of her hair. He pulls with such force, Regina's head smashes into the metal separating the front and back sections of the patrol car. Slamming on the brakes, the force and momentum frees her from Clint's fingers after a large chunk of her hair rips out. In a state of panic, Regina throws the car into park and jumps out. She's greeted by a swarm of soldiers. One pulls her backward as another takes aim and fires. The glass shatters and Clint's head explodes all over the back seat and rear window. Screams of sheer terror erupt all around the street as residents cringe in horror. Some flee on foot, while others jump back into their vehicles and try to leave the gridlocked road. Regina tries to intervene when the soldier who had grabbed her raises his weapon at an elderly woman ten feet away. The woman is dazed and confused, tears running down her wrinkled cheeks. She strides toward the barricade and refuses to stop, even when given the order to do so. Without thinking about the consequences, Regina lunges forward and pushes the barrel of the gun to the ground. Before she can say a word in protest, the soldier spins around and brings the butt of the gun directly to the side of her head. The impact knocks her to the ground. Blackness with specks of white dots cloud her vision. Shaking her head, she notices blood spurt out onto the road. She takes in a few gulps of cold air to regain her bearings, ignoring the throbbing pain. Then, all hell breaks loose. Just as the soldiers descend on the crowd, someone yells, Oh my god! Run! The dead are coming this way! Shots ring out in quick succession and the entire area descends into madness. Regina stands as a throng of the dead too large to count shamble over the rise from the freeway. The teeming mass isn't running, yet still move fast. The soldiers forget all about the fleeing live bodies and concentrate on taking out the dead. Lord, please take care of my family. Regina pulls out the Glock, reloads, and runs to join the line of defense to protect her hometown, knowing damn well she is too late. They all are too late. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, The Last Night Before the World Ended, by Ashley Fontaine. Ashley Fontaine is a major writing contributor to Fear from the Heartland. Ms. Fontaine is an international best-selling author and has penned over 23 works in numerous genres. Her works can be found on audible.com as well, including the first two books of the Legion novella series, narrated by me. To find more of her excellent work, check out her website at ashleyfontaine.net. That's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, Fontaine, F-O-N-T-A-I-N-N-E, dot net. Or connect with Ashley on Facebook at ashley.fontaine. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S.net. 
You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, chillingtalesfordarknights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.